Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Would you stand with us and sing as we worship God this morning?
of his sacrifice, if we trust him, we can experience total freedom in our lives. That is amazing to know. But as we sing this next song, would you just clear your minds? Would you just worship God, knowing that the one who conquered death is the one who gives us life? Yeah. 
And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel and shall not faint By His blood and in Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Whoa. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory. faith and worship you. You deserve all the praise and all the glory because of what you did. Thank you, God, for your sacrifice and for the freedom that that sacrifice provides. Be with us in the service. Pray, amen. And amen. Can you guys give it up for the team for leading us in worship this morning? You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. How are you guys feeling this morning? Good, good. If we haven't met before, my name is Will. I'm one of the pastors here. And hey, if this is your first time, if you are new to Epic, we especially want to welcome you. We believe this is a place where you can find home, where you can belong, where you can grow in your faith. And so here's what we would love to do. We would love to help you get connected, okay? And one of the best ways for us to do that is to ask you and to have you Fill out the Connect card, which is right in front of you on that seat back. So if you will, if you could grab that, if you brought a friend today, if you would grab it for them or if grab it for yourself and begin to fill that out. And after the gathering, you can take it to our Next Steps area there, guys. We just want to say hi, and we want to give you a gift just as another way of saying thank you for being with us today. And also... We want to invite you to join us at our Next Steps lunch, which is today, right after the 11 o'clock gathering. I know you're here at the 9 o'clock gathering, but if you have a way, if you live nearby and you could come back, we would love to have you. It's going to start around 12, 15. And there, we briefly just want to share how you can be a part of the Epic family and how you can receive all of the benefits that this community has to offer. We will have a lunch, and if you didn't RSVP, you don't have to worry about that. We did get extra lunches just for you. So join us. It's going to be a great time. And that's all I have this morning. But before Pastor Ben comes up to continue with our third wheel series, I want us to just pray. And I, I want us to ask God to speak to us, to move in our hearts, in our minds, and, and just have his way in our lives today. And so if you will, as I'm praying if you want to just say in your heart, say in your mind, or even just whisper, God, would you speak to me today? You know what I'm going through. And we know that your presence is here. Would you speak to us today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. God, that we were able to enter into your presence and, and lift up your name. And some of us might have been tuned out during that moment, but God, we know that you are here right now and that you can speak to every single one of us. We know that you have given Pastor Ben a word, and God, we just pray, whether it's through that word or something different you want to share with us, God, that in your presence, God, there is freedom, there is power, there is guidance, there is love. So have your way in our lives today and speak in a mighty way. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen.
Well, thrilled that you're here today. For those of you in the room, love to see your faces. I know many of you are watching online or you'll check this out later in the week. Yesterday, our students, our Epic students, return from being at Fuge Camp for, for the past week. I don't know what we're clapping for. I guess some, maybe we didn't know if you were coming back. But um, from what I've already heard, because I had three students there, as well as a few conversations with others, they had an amazing time. And Anthony and Krista and Yordi, who's here. Ben, you didn't go, but your wife got to go while you held down the fort here. Thank you. Um, just hearing about how God showed up. And uh, how he brought you guys closer as a student ministry, which I love both as a pastor, perhaps even more as a father of four teenagers. And I'm excited about the future of this ministry because we really do believe that the best is yet to come. And, and what I want to say to you as a church, thank you for praying. For those of you that prayed over this past week while our students were gone, I also want to say thanks to all of you who give to the mission of Epic Church. Because when you and I give, we are personally investing in the next generation. And listen, you can't have a vision without having a vision for the next generation. It doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm all about us in our, you know, those of us in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. But we've got to continue to invest in the next generation. So thanks for your leadership, Anthony. Anthony oversees that from a staff lens on our church. And for all of you who invest in the next generation, just, man, for me to walk down that kid's hallway a moment ago, just thanking every person serving today. And if you get a chance to do that, say thanks. Whenever I think of the word freedom, it's hard for me not to be reminded how many times this word has been used over the last year and a half. Can I get a witness? Right? And the reason that we've used the word freedom so much is because there's been another word that's been introduced to our daily vernacular, and it's the word restrictions. And there's been so much talk, has there not been, about they're taking away our freedom. And I'm you're like, oh, what side is he on? I don't do the sides thing. I pastor this crazy congregation. I do not do the sides thing. I have four kids and a wife. I do not do the sides thing. I am not here to make a point about whether our freedoms have been taken away, but I am here today, and I want to tell you right where I'm going from the get-go today. I am here to tell you that I believe that it is critical that you and I understand what freedom actually is and how freedom actually works. In fact, I want to sum up my entire desire for today for all of us when I just give you the title. This is my desire for every single one of us. Here it is. Don't miss your freedom. Don't miss your freedom. And some of you today, you believe, right now, you believe that you are as free as you've ever been in your entire life. And what I'm going to tell some of you today through the scriptures is that you're not free yet. And there are others of you who feel like you've lost your freedom. There's a government entity that's taken it away. There's a boss that's harsh that's taken it away. Carl the Fog, you feel like has taken away your freedom. Anybody else besides me? But that's not true. It feels true, right? It's been like 78 straight days of fog where I live, but it is not true. If you are free, you are free indeed. And there's no power, there's no person in this room or any other room that's going to take that away. And I believe some of you are going to step into that breakthrough known as freedom today, and you're going to celebrate when you do. And it's going to be one of those moments where you say, I cannot believe I've missed this up until now. Others of you are going to regain your freedom. Others of you are going to wrestle with your definition of freedom, and I believe God is going to do something that's going to be so powerful, whether you're watching online or you're right here in the room today. Our text for today is Galatians chapter 5. I want to get right to it because it is weighty, it is instructive, and it's Galatians 5 verses 13 through 26, and I just want you to stand with me, just what we do here to honor God's word. There's nothing magical about standing, and if you can't stand, obviously, no worries, unless you are one of my kids. (laughs) Then you better stand. Just kidding, man. I love you, and you know that. Galatians 5, 13 through 26, this is from the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Galatian Christians, and he says in verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Let's just pause. I'm going to say this. I want you to repeat it after me. I have been called to be free. It's not, hey, if you prefer it, you can have it. It is not, hey, for a few of you that are super spiritual, you can have it. You've been called to be free. It's not just something you opt into. It is something you have been called to. But if you don't step into your calling of freedom, you're going to miss it. 
And if you miss it, there are all kinds of implications. But here's the thing. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you're thinking, what does loving my neighbor have to do with freedom? If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Got a word for somebody today. So I say, this is Paul to the Galatians. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, Paul writes, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But there's an alternative. But the fruit of the Spirit, oh man, it's love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, there's our life, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. You may be seated. God, I pray that as you've spoken this text to my heart, these truths to my heart, I pray that you would speak by the power of your spirit to every heart in this room, every heart that is watching. And for those of us that are clinging to what we think is freedom, would you come and bring true freedom into our lives today? In Jesus' name, amen. When you and I want to know how we're doing spiritually, it is somewhat easy to evaluate where we are with God in a moment. You might ask questions like this, do I feel close to God? Am I spending time praying, which involves speaking to God, but it also involves listening to God? Am I spending some time, most days at least, in the scriptures because we believe that all authority is in the word of God and that God has spoken and we want to sink his words into our hearts and into our minds? And these are great questions to ask, but I want to urge you to go further when you're evaluating your spirituality. I want you to go further than this, and here's how I want to say it. If you want to know how your spiritual life is going... Observe how you're treating other people. Anybody wish you could just answer that question by just talking about your prayer life? Anybody else had a great time with God? At least you thought you were having a great time with God. One of your kids interrupts you and then you speak harshly to them. God, I don't know about him or her, but I'm so glad we're good. Right? Or you had a conversation with a spouse or a coworker? Right? Anybody ever feel like you have the, like the best time with God in the morning and someone on your train or bus or walking or driving just ruins your morning? You're like, God, I want to go to Old Testament on that one, right? I want to go to the Psalms where David's like, crush them. Um, but God, I love you. I, I'm so glad that, that we're good. And, and, and Paul says so much in this text. Now, let's understand a little bit about the entire book of Galatians. There are six chapters. Uh, what year was this? 2012, 13? When did we did the entire book of Galatians? I know, you were here. You were here. Your hair was shorter, but you were still handsome. We did a series called No More Religion, but here's the theme Paul has in mind whenever he writes this letter to the Galatian Christians. The theme is freedom. The theme is freedom. And the reason the theme is freedom, and by the way, whenever you read these letters from Paul to different churches, there's a reason that he's writing what he's writing and why you don't see all of his same writings in book after book, though there's a lot of overlap. There are things going on in those churches, so he speaks into them. What had happened in the churches and Christians in Galatia is that people were beginning to teach, yes, we know the gospel message is awesome. Jesus came to this earth. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead like we just sang about, but there's also these external things that you have to do. That's what the Galatians began to teach in their churches. And Paul's like, no, you don't have to do those things. You have been set free. That's why Paul writes in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Would you just say that? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He set us free. You are free. You've been called to freedom. And yet so many of us are living in bondage thinking that we're free. There's hope today though. I think there's a lot of hope. And so what has Jesus set us free from? Jesus has set us free from sin, 
Jesus has set us free from having to perfectly observe the law. Jesus has set us free from an eternity away from him and from the Father. Jesus has set us free. And let me give you the logical question when we think about freedom. Here's the, you'll see it on the screen. Here's the logical question we have with freedom. Am I free to do anything I want to? The world would say yes. And the world would say to me right now, Ben, that's the epitome of freedom. They would also say to me, Ben, if you're going to come up with a definition, might I remind you that it's 2021 and you're standing on a stage beneath Market Street in downtown San Francisco. Are you free to do anything you want to? I mean, isn't this the philosophy of our day? Isn't this what people have had such a problem with being restricted in some capacity over the last year and a half with perhaps more on the way this week? Am I free? to do anything I want to. Jesus doesn't think about freedom like that. So if we're going to orient our lives around Jesus, if we're going to center around his ways and his words and his will, we can't think about freedom like that. So how should we think about freedom? Tim Keller's writing on freedom and restrictions has really helped me out, and I want to share one quote from him in his book, Making Sense of God. Keller writes, Real freedom comes from a strategic loss of some freedoms in order to gain others. It is not the absence of constraints that's huge. The world thinks freedom equals absence of constraints. It's not the absence of constraints, but it is choosing the what? The right constraints and the right freedoms to lose. So I want to help you through an exercise reframe how you think about freedom, okay? Who is more free, a man who's with a different woman every week because he's free, or a man who has restricted himself to one woman for the last 20 years? Who's more free? That wasn't rhetorical. I know those of you at home, you're answering because you're alone. These guys are like, what if? What if? The world says that the man who is free to be with a different woman every week is free, and I want to say that man is enslaved. I have not been a perfect husband, but I have restricted myself to my wife, Shauna, for the last now just over 20 years, and I want to promise you that I have more freedom in that restriction than he ever will until he changes his ways. Who's more free, the person that goes to a different church every month searching for the perfect church that has never and will never exist this side of heaven? They go, they don't ever contribute anything to that church, and then they move on to the next church, and they're not known, and they're not accountable, and they're not contributing, and they go, is that person more free, or is the person in this room who many of you have done this, you've restricted yourself to one church community, you've become deeply attached, you are known, you care for, and are cared for here. Who has more freedom? Let me ask you, please. I've got one more for you because I want you to step into your freedom. So many of us, including the self right here on stage, has missed my freedom for way too long. I thought I had it, but I was actually in bondage to something. Who is more free? The person who says, I am my own man. I am my own woman. I won't follow anyone, including God. I am free. I am free. I am free. Or the person who goes, hey, no, no, no. I've restricted myself to his will. I've restricted myself to the word of God. I've restricted myself to his ways. I've restricted myself to life in the spirit. You tell me who's more free. Anybody having freedom come into a little sharper focus today besides me? And I know I got a head start. I've I've sat with this for a couple months. And I didn't preach last week. And people told me after last week that if I didn't preach better, that Shauna was going to take my job Which is fine, but I would have to take hers, and I am not gifted or equipped to do so. She she gave a great message last week. Guys, I want your freedom. You've been called to freedom. And the, you know, a lot of things work different in the world than they work in the church, but this is one of those words that is catastrophically different. Freedom, right? We live in a city that prides itself on total freedom. But that freedom hasn't led to wholeness. That freedom hasn't led to peace. That freedom hasn't ended our drug endemic. That freedom hasn't cured mental health. Would you agree with me? Just being logical for a second. We'll get back to the word in just a moment. Freedom hasn't, I mean, 
some people who think they're the most free are the ones who are most in handcuffs. And we've all been there. Are you free to do what you want? Sure. Sure. But where does that what does that get us? And another thing that stood out to me that was fascinating in this text is how the text is book-ended. Right? So our text is 13 through 26. I'm going to point out just that what it's bound by is really fascinating to me, but you've got to get into the text. This is the text about spirit and flesh. Would you agree? But if we think it's just about that, we will miss the bookends of this text, which are really about humility and pride. So look at verse 13. It says that we should serve one another How? What's the adverb there? Humbly. So we have this this piece on humility in the beginning, and then how does the text end? It ends by saying, do not be conceited. And so one of the ways that you and I can understand whether our life is more in the flesh or more in the spirit is to look on how we're doing from the humility, pride spectrum. Which one of those are you trending towards, pride or humility? Humility. That's one of the best ways to know if you're living by the Spirit that we've been talking about now for nine weeks with two more to go, or if you're living by the flesh. And let me give you this word, because what I see a lot is people want to be, uh, have all of this and have all of that, but let me give you this on humility and pride and life in the Spirit. You cannot be full of the Spirit if you are full of yourself. I cannot be full of the Spirit if I am full of myself. I cannot get the benefits of the Spirit and making it all about me. I can't make, like, that's not what the Spirit is doing. He's pointing away from me, pointing to God. It doesn't humiliate me. It gives me confidence. But I can't be full of the Spirit if I am full of myself. And then Paul goes on and he says this thing. He says, the entire law is summed up in how many commands? Just one. You're like, Ben, why is he saying that? Here's why he's saying that. Because they were saying you had to do all these other things. Jesus isn't quite enough. Like, he gets you almost to the line, but then um, anybody know what the Galatians had to do if they really wanted to cross the line? Circumcision. And these weren't eight-day-olds, right? And so you, can you imagine someone like me standing up and saying, hey, instead of join a team Sunday, <laughs> we've got great medical personnel who are ready to get you across the line so you have complete relationship with God. Anybody up for that. And what Paul is saying, that's, you don't have to do all those extra things. Here's the entire law summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as we hear that word, I think it's really important to remember that Jesus did not restrict neighbor to people who have our skin color, who vote with our political party, or who even share our faith. While we cannot expect the world to love in that way, I believe, tell me if you're with me, that we absolutely should expect more of those who claim to have the Spirit of God in us. Anybody? You see, we have an enemy who wants us to think that we are each other's enemies. So I don't want to ask you today, how are you treating the people who do all the things that you do, who look like you, even who share your faith in Jesus? If you're a Christian, I want to ask you, how are you seeing people who don't? Are they more enemy or are they more neighbor? I hope you're with me on this. There is so much in the world today that grieves me. But I'm even more grieved by what I see in the capital C church. And some of you, you know how every time when somebody's saying something, you, everybody asks the question, is he talking about me? You remember this when Jesus is like, one of you is going to betray me, and they are like, is, are you talking about me? You talking about me? And so you make sense when you do that an individual. Now it's like, I'm talking about the capital C church. You're talking about our church? If it applies. But I'm just grieved by what I see, by people claiming the name of Jesus. I mean, it's always at this moment. Filter? No filter? say it securing my job I mean what were people doing praying to Jesus in the capital on January 6 what was that reconcile that one for me I'm grieved by what I see among Christians 
And here's the thing, one, one of the things I'm always thinking through, and so this might even answer some of your questions that you have asked and wanted to ask but haven't asked this yet. Um, what I know is that God has called us as a pastoral team to pastor this congregation. So what we want to know, the reason Paul's writing what he's writing to the Galatian church is because he knew that church. Are you with me? Right? It would, it, it, he didn't need to write 1 Corinthians to the Galatians. Right? They weren't having sex in the lobby of the church. You're like, Corinthians? I know, you should read the Bible. Uh, he wrote them about what they were doing with their sexual lives. He wrote the Galatians about how they needed to treat one another. Because anybody been anywhere where you feel like they're first class and second class citizens? Anybody? Let's lighten it up a little bit, right? Anybody besides me when you get on an airplane feel like a second class citizen? I'm like, man, how many rows of Polaris are there? Maybe it goes back to 43. <laughs> I'm like, what? Second class, second class. I'm on the aisle, though, right? I'm a little obsessive personality-wise. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pay for it. And then all these ways, you, and so in the Galatians, you had, let's just think about this, and it's going to be hard because we need to really think modern-day example because circumcision is not a thing, and I don't even want to get into how do they know. But those who were circumcised, were seen as the ones who were in, first class. They had what it took to be in God's favor, in God's good grace. And those who weren't were made to feel less than. And when the God card's put on something, then you feel like, oh, I, I'm real. And Paul's going, stop. Stop doing that. And, and, and you know, what grieves me about our world so much and what grieves me about the church today is that there's just so much hatred and so much attack. There is so much anger and so much outrage. I mean, this whole idea of cancel culture, can I remind us, and you'll see this on the screen, we follow a Savior who canceled sin but never canceled people. Canceled my sin, but he didn't cancel me. Look at verse 15. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be what? Like, oh, Ben, I just wanted to put him in their place. I just needed them to know that there's another side. I can't let them go on living because of what they've done. If you bite and devour each other, here's the warning. Watch out. Take notice. Take heed. Be careful because you're going to destroy other people in the church. And in the process, you're going to be destroyed. If humans... Destroying other humans doesn't break your heart, you might be part of the problem. If humans, destroying other humans, let me say it in a different way to, to bring the weight up a little bit. If people bearing the image of God, destroying other people bearing the image of God doesn't break your heart, let me give you this gift. Spend some time reflecting. Go into that Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Great reflection prayer out of the end of Psalm 139. So what are you saying? Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we have to all be the same people with the same opinions about all the things. Aren't you glad? Anybody even married to someone who has the same opinions about all the things? Not me. No. She's not here, man. You're safe. He's not here. You're safe, Lindsay. I know you and Ben. Anyway. So you don't have to do that in the church. You don't have to have the same personality. You don't have to have the same political party. Uh, you don't have to, to believe all the things about all the things. But let me say it this way. Disagreements in the epic community are welcome and expected, but we will not allow anyone to destroy others here. Say it again. Disagreements, right? My family can't even decide if we all like the same food and where we're going to eat. Disagreements are fine. Ben, if I was a pastor, I would do it different. Okay. 24 years, seven months, and no. Um, you can have it. Don't do the math. I was just making a number up. 
I, there is not a clock ticking in my office. It says only 24 years to go. I don't even know how old I would be, but I'm working on it. Disagreements are welcomed. But we're not going to allow you to destroy anyone here. Two weeks ago, I was doing a wedding up in Sonoma. And after the ceremony, the bride and groom, who are a couple in our church, they were getting pictures made by Krista and Anthony. They were the photographers, which is super fun, because I didn't really know anyone else there that day besides the bride and groom. And I'm just sitting at a winery, picnic table, and there's some appetizers, you know, for those of us who weren't invited to do photos. And uh, there are some appetizers there, and, and a, a woman starts talking to me, and she says to me, um, I really like that ceremony. Um, remember, there's no such thing as a bad, short wedding ceremony. Somebody said, the sermons are the same, but you're getting a little winded here. And she said, can I ask you a few questions about your church? And I'm like, oh, man. And it's not, it's not just she and I. Like, it's, it's a picnic table full of people. I'm like, here we go. You just never know. Anybody else, like when someone requests a meeting, you're like, oh, man, I'm already anxious. Anybody have the courage to write back? Could you tell me what this is about? Oh, Will loves to take those meetings. I don't like those meetings. And here's what she asked me. She, she, said, um, she said, does your church excommunicate people who've been divorced? And it broke my heart because either she had heard about a church or that churches do that, or she had a personal experience of divorce. And I said, absolutely not. I mean, listen, we believe Jesus takes marriage seriously, but we also believe he loves to restore Then I said this, let me tell you who we do excommunicate from our church. Now everybody's listening. (laughs) We ask people not to come back who are destroying others in this community. I take seriously, as does our pastoral team, the charge to protect and guard the flock. I like to use it as a parenting example. I love providing and protecting for all four of my kids If one of them comes after one of the other ones, they've made themselves my enemy. They opted into it, and now I've got a guard. Though they are a son or daughter of mine, now they've come against my son or daughter, even though they are that. And so, who do we ask to leave people who want to destroy others here? We're serious about that. We're serious about that. We care for you, and we want you to be able to be nurtured and to grow and to fulfill your God-given purpose. And we'll make sure to protect you from people who want to destroy or attack you. Paul writes that the spirit and the flesh are in conflict with each other. Anybody ever known that to be true besides me? Seriously, like, okay, I had it. I'm just going for it today. Worship team left me too much time. And we don't want you to get out early. So I had oatmeal for breakfast this morning. Just preparing for the all-inclusive later this week. And, uh, and then I walk back here, and someone has brought these little cupcakes from Nothing Bunt Cakes. And as I told you before, now I have a stewardship issue. <laughs> and now you know why you should be on the production team. Okay, we only do it once a year. But it's like spirit, flesh. Like they're in conflict, right? Jesus even said to his disciples, the spirit is willing, but you can say this, but the flesh is, yeah, it is. So they're always going to be in conflict. And so sometimes we read that and we go, yeah, I'm just going to wake up Monday morning tomorrow and I just don't know. Am I going to have a spiritual life or a fleshly life? Like I don't have any control over that. It's just going to happen one way or the other. You do have a say-so in whether spirit comes out of your life or flesh. Do you know that? That's on you. Spirit is willing. Say that with me. Spirit is? The Holy Spirit's willing. He's not like, suffer for three days in the flesh. I'll show up to rescue you on Thursday. He wants to show up now. And when you get up tomorrow morning, he wants you to live in him. Look at four verbs related to life in the spirit. In 16, he says that we are to walk by the spirit. In 17, he said, or 18, he says, be led by the spirit. In 2 and 25, he says, um, what does he say in 25? He says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Do you know it's up to you whether the spirit or flesh comes out? I didn't say it was easy. I didn't say it was easy. But you can live in the spirit, you can walk by the spirit, you can keep in step with the spirit, you can be led by the spirit, or you can be led by the flesh. The flesh promises freedom, but it doesn't fulfill it. 
doesn't give us freedom. And today, I hope you would spend some time evaluating what's present in your life. And you may say, Ben, I've heard what you've said, but is there a way to evaluate whether or not I'm more spirit-led or flesh-led? There is. There are outcomes given to us in this text. Look at verse 19. Paul writes, and it's an interesting um, use of words to me. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sometimes our exterior is acting like something spiritual, but deep down we probably know it's something of the flesh, don't we? Anybody besides me? Only four of you. Others of you were about to give you the list. Now you know. <laughs> Paul's like, the acts of the flesh are obvious, but Ben, when you have people in your church that are, don't want to admit it, just give them the list of 15. Here we go. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Paul gives us 15 things. That's a long list. Would you agree? And then he's like, but Ben, there's way more than 15. He says, and the like. He's like, I just can't keep writing. Those are the outcomes of life in the flesh. And look at verse 21. I love you. That's why I don't want to hide this from you. I care about your future on this earth, and I care about your eternal life. That's why I can't hide this from you. In verse 21, he says this. Those who live like this will what? Not inherit the kingdom of God. Ben, why would I want to inherit the kingdom of God? Because that's the only king that will last with the only kingdom that will remain. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Ben, do I get the kingdom of God if I just avoid these things? No, that's not the point. But, but if your entire life is full of these things and that never changes, you will not spend eternity with God because you've evidenced that you don't have the spirit of God in you, which is evidence that you never made Jesus your Lord, which means that you will be separated from Jesus for all of eternity. And we created this church so that you wouldn't be. And we pray towards the end so that you wouldn't be. But there's also other outcomes, aren't you glad? Anybody want some fruit of the Spirit flowing in their lives? Love. Anybody want less love or more love? Joy. Peace. Forbearance. Ben, what does that mean? Let's think patience. Kindness. This is what life in the Spirit looks like. Goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there's no law. You're free to enjoy those things in the Spirit. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And remember, we don't crucify the flesh by the flesh. We crucify the flesh by the help of the Spirit. One commentator said that to walk in the Spirit or to be led by the Spirit means this, to go where the Spirit is going, to listen to His voice, to discern His will, and to follow His guidance. Go where He's going. Listen to His voice. Discern His will. And follow His guidance. Don't miss your freedom. It's for you. Jesus came to give you freedom. One question I think we need to ask is this. What did Jesus do with his freedom? I mean, guys, there's never been a more free being in the universe. Agreed with me? If you create the world, you're kind of free from what it could hold you down with. Right? He's free. Jesus himself said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If he has all authority, it means he's not subservient to some human ruler or, or to uh, some empire. Are you with me? He's the most free person in the entire universe. What does he do with that freedom? Counterintuitive. He restricts himself. Why? Why? I mean, he restricts himself to a little baby's body. Is there anything more restricted than a baby's body? He grows up and he restricts himself to serving people who are going to walk out on him. John, 17, or John 13 says, because he knew, because he knew where he came from and where he was going, he put a towel around his waist and washed his disciples' feet. Is there a greater restriction 
You know what that looks like to me? The opposite of freedom. Would you agree? Who does that? The person who's a slave is the one who washes feet. Why is he restricting himself? Why does he restrict himself to one time in one place? Why does he end up restricting himself to a cross? Would you do that with your freedom? Does that run a little counterculture to the world? Why does he restrict himself? I was reading yesterday in my own time with God in Luke 23. He has restricted himself to a cross and then the mocking begins. If you are really the Messiah, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And he says he could have called angels to rescue him because he was free to do so. And when Jesus called them, they would have had to say yes because he's not the slave, he's the king. So what in the world is he doing restricting himself to that brutal death on a cross? I thought he was free. He's restricting himself on that cross for your freedom. For my freedom. He did not use his freedom to indulge the flesh. But he loved like a good neighbor, people who were nothing like him. He was perfect and none of us have been. He restricts himself so that he can give us freedom. Have you been missing true freedom? Don't miss it anymore. Today's the day, not because of some performance. Galatians is saying, don't do that. Today's the day that you can step across the line of faith and go, I thought I was free, but I have been in bondage. Today, Jesus, I want your freedom. If you would restrict yourself to buy that for me, I want to step into that life. You can do that today. You can let us know on your card. You can reach out to one of us. You can talk to us afterwards. But today, don't miss your freedom. And here's what's beautiful about the freedom Jesus gives. No one can take it away. Your pastor can't take it away. I don't want to, but I can't. A bad boss can't take it away. Unemployment can't take it away. Poverty can't take it away. Death one day will not take away your freedom because the one who is the most free restricted himself to buy your permanent freedom. And then for the rest of us, how are you using your freedom to serve yourself or to serve others? You've heard us do this join a team push for the last month. We're almost to our goal. Guys, we're not doing that just to fulfill the mission of Epic for this next season. We're doing it because we know that that's what's best for you. You've not been set free to serve yourself. Aren't you glad we have a Savior who didn't just serve himself but served us? And then where are you on the humility pride thing? And when you look at what's spilling out into your life, remember whatever's inside of us always comes out of us. Is it the work of the flesh or is it the fruit of the Spirit? And then what are you going to do with your freedom? Where will you restrict yourself? I mean, think about the great athletes. They want the freedom of competing at a high level, so what do they do? They restrict themselves. When you bring a child in the world, does that bring more worldly freedom or more restriction in this world? Only those of us who have, but the rest of you can imagine. You're like, Ben, no, I kept your kids when they were young. Restrictions. Let's choose the right restrictions so that we can walk in the freedom that Jesus came to give us. Let me pray for us today. Jesus, thank you so much that you came to set us free. Thank you that you, (laughs) thank you that you restricted yourself so that we could have freedom, so that we could walk in freedom, so that we could be free to love and free to walk by the Spirit, and we could have these things flowing into our lives, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. Thank you that we could have faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, things that we could never produce in the flesh. God, I pray for the people in this room who walked in here today going, not even sure why I'm at church. I'm, I've never been more free to do my own thing in my entire life. God, I pray today they would step into true freedom. Jesus, I pray we would become the kind of community that uses our freedom not to indulge the flesh and serve ourselves, but we use our freedom to love and serve people who are like us and nothing like us. Jesus, I pray by your spirit that many would walk in a freedom today that they've never known prior to this moment. 
Thank you for restricting yourself so that we could have life, so that we could have freedom, so that we could be known by you, and that we could stay in step with your spirit. And would you help us to do that? In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand as we just sing about the freedom that God's come to give us. And guys, you don't have to hold out on this. It is for your good. It is for your best to step into the freedom that Jesus came to give you. Come 
join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested in my life. song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, oh, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. and a freedom that never has to end. I don't know about you, but today's just one of those days where just I'm especially aware and especially grateful for what it means to be a part of this family, to be a part of this epic church family. And we're so glad that you are too. And so thank you guys so much for being here. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat for just a minute. You know, over the last three months, today we're starting August. Is that unbelievable to anybody else? But over the last three months here at Epic, we have welcomed 100, 148 new people into this Epic community. Yeah, which has just been incredible. And if you're one of those new people, we say welcome. We say we're so glad that you're here. It's why we're here. And for all of you who give consistently and proportionally to the mission of God here at Epic, I want to say thank you because it is your generosity that has allowed us to welcome in all of these people. When people are looking for a church, it's your generosity that makes it possible for them to know that we're here. And then when they show up here, it's your generosity that makes it possible for them to gather with us on Sundays, to gather online, to join a small group, and to step onto one of these teams. And so we say thank you so much for the way that you give. And if you want to join us in this journey of generosity, if you want to give for the first time today and to know that your giving makes a difference, you can do that. You can easily follow the prompts on the screen. You can give from your phone. You can automate your giving online. You can even use the envelope in the seat back in front of you and you can drop it in the giving boxes that are along the walls before you go today. But again, we want to say thank you. On August 15th, I'm not sure if you've got that date marked on your calendar, but we have it marked on ours. On August 15th, we're saying welcome home and I want you guys to watch this video to find out why. They say there's no place like home. Home is that safe haven, a refuge, the 
place where everything feels familiar, a place where we're known and loved and cared for, a place where our children learn, grow, we equip them, and then we send them out into the world. But we know and they know they can always come back home. It's a place where we're challenged and a place where we can be vulnerable. It's a place that meets our needs, a place where we can be comfortable and feel accepted for exactly who we are. They say that home isn't a place, it's more of a feeling, but we think that place really matters too. The beautiful thing about home is that anytime you leave, it feels even better to come back. We're glad to have the family back together. Welcome home. Yes. We are so glad to have the family back together. And as people continue to come back in person here at Epic, we say welcome home on August 15th. And as people return from their summer, summer travels, we say welcome home. As you guys get ready for school year or coming back to work in the city, we say welcome home. And so Mark August 15th down. We're going to have just fun things happening that day. It's going to be a great day. You don't want to miss. We've got a pop-up swag shop that day. I don't fully know what that means, but I do know you don't want to miss it because things that you've seen with our new logo on it are going to be available for you that day. We've got sweet treats for everyone that day, and so you definitely don't want to miss that. And as we lead into August 15th, it's been our goal to add 40 people, 40 of you, to our EPIC teams. You heard Ben mention that. This gives us the opportunity to meet the moment that we find ourselves in. And so to this date, we have already added 36 people to our team, which is so incredible. Thanks to so many of you who have joined our team in the last few weeks. So we're looking to add a few more. And so if you want to use your gifts to serve people in this church, if you want to use your gifts to help accomplish the mission that God has given us, you can do that by joining a team today. And then as you go, if you are new here, please stop by the Next Steps area. We would love to say hi before you leave today. You guys go ahead and stand to your feet for just a moment before we're dismissed. May God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you today and give you peace. And may you choose to walk in freedom today, not only for yourself, but for the sake of others. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Thank you so much for joining us on the Epic Church live stream today. We hope that you found the experience encouraging and helpful in your faith. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit our website, our Epic Church app, or any of our social media channels where you can watch past messages as well as keep up with what God is doing in and through our community here. Wherever you're joining us from, we hope that you have a great